God first uses it to describe himself, his arrows are drunk with blood. 4. I will make mine arrows drunk with blood, and my sword shall devour flesh. Deuteronomy 32.42. 2. God's sword is also drunk with blood, just like his arrows. 5. This is the day of the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance, that he may avenge him of his adversaries, and the sword shall devour, and it shall be satiate and made drunk with their blood. Jeremiah 46.10. 3. God's sword and arrows won't be the only things drunk with blood. God also plans to force people, before he kills them, to eat their own flesh and get drunk on their own blood. 6. I will feed them that oppress thee with their own flesh, and they shall be drunken with their own blood, as with sweet wine. Isaiah 49.26. 4. After God kills people, he will feed their bodies to the birds and beasts until they, too, become drunk with blood. 7. Thus saith the Lord God, Speak unto every feathered fowl, and to every beast of the field, Assemble yourselves, and come, gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice that I do sacrifice for you. Even a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel, that ye may eat flesh, and drink blood. Ye shall eat the flesh of the mighty, and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, and ye shall eat fat till ye be full, and drink blood till ye be drunken, of my sacrifice which I have sacrificed for you. Ezekiel 39.17, 19. I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, and when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Revelation 17.6. God's first killing is hard to beat. He killed everything. Here's how he described it. The Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man, and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Genesis 6.7. Behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth, to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life, from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. 6.17. Every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. 7.4. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl, and of cattle, and of beast, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land, died, and every living substance was destroyed which was upon the face of the ground, both man, and cattle, and the creeping things, and the fowl of the heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth, and Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. 7.21-23. There came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot seeing them rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground, and he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early, and go, and your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him, and entered into his house, and he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread. And they did eat. 19.1-3. Then a strange thing happened. Strange things often happen in the Bible. Every man in the city of Sodom came to Lot's house and demanded to have sex with Lot's two angel friends. The men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter, and they called unto Lot, and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. 19.4-5. Man, those must have been some good-looking angels. Lot's response was to protect the angels who you'd think could take care of themselves by offering the sex-crazed mob his two virgin daughters instead. Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man, let me, I, pray you, bring them out unto you, and to ye to them is as good in your eyes. 19.8. This is a man, by the way, whom the Bible calls, just and righteous, in 2. Peter 2, 7-8. A few verses later he will get drunk and impregnate both his virgin daughters. See Genesis 19.30-38 but that's another lovely Bible story. As it turns out, though, there is no time for Lot to make good on his kind offer. Because God is getting ready to commit another mass murder. The angels strike. The sodomites blind, and tell Lot to flee, along with his wife and virgin. Daughters, and their husbands. But the men, smote the men that were at the door of the house with. Blindness, and the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides? 
son in, law, and thy sons, and thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city. Bring them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. 19.10-13. And then all hell breaks loose. The Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire. From the Lord out of heaven. 19.24. Okay, so that's it. That is God's second mass murder. But how many people did God smash and burn to death in Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, I, of course, have no idea. I don't think any of this actually happened. But I'll guess 2,000, 1,000 from each city. 4. Remember Lot's wife forget Jesus. Although this is God's fourth killing event, it is the first of God's 2,821,364. Countable victims. It's interesting that God's first countable victim is unnamed. God killed Mrs. Lot without even knowing, or at least telling us her name. And what was it that got God's attention? What did she do that caused him to kill her? She looked back at the place she had lived all her life. She looked back as her family, friends, and neighbors were being smashed and burned to death by God. She looked back, but his wife looked back from behind him. And she became a pillar of salt. Genesis 19.26. And, of course, the angel told her not to. The angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife, and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters. When they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life, look not behind. B. 19.15-17. Or did he, who was the angel talking to here? To Lot alone or to him and his family? And if it was to Lot alone, did Lot tell his wife? Would it matter to God if no one bothered to tell her? Would he kill her anyway? Who knows? Or cares? A God who would kill a woman for looking back as everyone she has ever known as being burned to death is a monster God. An arbitrary, random killer. I have met Christians who ignore this story, as they ignore pretty much everything in the Old Testament. They sometimes call themselves red letter. Christians, meaning that they base their beliefs on the words of Jesus. But Jesus believed in the story about Sodom and Gomorrah, he believed in the story about Lot's wife. He saw nothing wrong with any of it. In fact, he said that, when he returns at the end of the world it will be just like that. You can check for yourself in your red letter Bible. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the son of man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noe entered into the ark, and the flood came, and destroyed them all. Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded, but the same day that Lot went out of Sodom it rained fire and brimstone from heaven, and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Remember Lot's wife. Luke 17.26-32. Jesus had no problem with God's first two mass murders the flood of Noah and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah or with God's killing of Lot's wife. It'll be just like that at the end of the world, if Jesus has anything to say about it. So remember Lot's wife, and forget Jesus. 5. When they were sore, Dinah's brethren slew all the males. The story begins when Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, goes out to meet her Hivite neighbors. Dinah the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. Genesis 34, 1. While she was visiting, a young Hivite man named Shechem saw her and immediately fell in love with her. Well, maybe not immediately, but after he had sex with her, anyway. The Bible doesn't say whether it was consensual or not. And when Shechem the son of Hamer the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her, and lay with her, and defiled her and his soul clave unto Dinah, and he loved the damsel, and spake kindly unto the damsel. 34.2-3. Shechem told his father that he'd like to marry Dinah. Shechem spake unto his father Hamer, saying, Get me this damsel to wife.34.4. So Hamer went to talk to Jacob about it. And Hamer the father of Shechem went out unto Jacob to commune with him, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longeth for your daughter. I pray you give her him to wife. 34.6-8. Hamer suggested that the Havites and the Israelites live together in peace, trading and intermarrying with one other, and make ye marriages with us, and give your daughters unto us, and take 
our daughters unto you, and ye shall dwell with us, and the land shall be before you, dwell and trade ye therein, and get you possessions therein. 34.9-10. Jacob didn't seem to care much about it, one way or another. But his sons did. It was all about the Hivites' penises. The sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamer his father deceitfully, and said, We cannot do this thing, to give our sister to one that is uncircumcised. 34.13-14. The problem was that little flap of skin at the tip of the Hivites' penises. If They'd just cut that off, then they could all live happily together in peace. But in this will we consent unto you, if ye will be as we be, that every male of you be circumcised, then will we give our daughters unto you, and we will take your daughters to us, and we will dwell with you, and we will become one people. 34.15-16. Hamer agrees to this. He, along with his son and all the male Havites, cut off. That little flap of skin at the end of their penises is a sacrifice for peace. Greater. Love hath no father than this, that he cut off his own foreskin for his son. And Hamer and Shechem his son, communed with the men of their city. Saying, These men are peaceable with us, therefore let them dwell in the land, and trade therein, for the land, behold, it is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters to us for wives, and let us give them our daughters. Only herein will the men consent unto us for to dwell with us, to be own people, if every male among us be circumcised, as they are circumcised. Let us consent unto them, and they will dwell with us. 34.20-21. Sahamer, Shechem and every male Hivite cut off that little flap of skin that offends God so much. And every male was circumcised. 34.24. And Dinah and Shechem were married and everyone lived happily ever after. Just kidding. Here's what really happened. And it came to pass on the third day, when they were sore, the two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brethren, took each man his sword, and came upon the city boldly, and slew all the males. And they slew Hamer and Shechem his son with the edge of the sword, and took Dinah out of Shechem's house, and went out. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain, and spoiled the city, because they had defiled their sister, and all their wealth, and all their little ones, and their wives took they captive, and spoiled even all that was in the house. 34.25-29. Jacob's sons slaughtered Shechem, Hamer, and all the Hivite males while they were recovering from their circumcisions, and then stole their possessions and enslaved their wives. But at least Hamer died for something worthwhile, the happiness of his son, and peace in the world. It's a nasty story, of course, but it isn't entirely clear, from Genesis 34 anyway, what God had to do with it. And for that reason, I originally left it off the list of God's killings. However the Deuterocanonical book of Judith clears all that up. Very nicely. Here's what it says. O Lord God of my father Simeon, who gavest him a sword to execute. Vengeance against strangers, who had defiled by their uncleanness, and uncovered the virgin unto confusion and who gavest their wives to be made a prey, and their daughters into captivity, who were zealous with thy zeal. Judith 9.2-3. So God not only approved of the Shechem massacre, he gave Simeon the sword to do it with. Thank God for the Catholic Bible. Since the Bible doesn't say how many Havites were killed in this massacre, I just gave it the usual 1,000 for a standard biblical massacre. But two victims were, known by name, Shechem and Hamer, so I added two to the, biblical number, for God's killings. 6. Ur was wicked in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord slew him. This is the first named person who was directly killed by God. We don't know, much about him. We know his name, Ur, his father's name, Judah, his mother's name, Shua, and his wife's name, Tamar. Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite, whose name was Shua. And he took her, and went in unto her. And she conceived, and bare, a son, and he called his name Ur. And Judah took a wife for Ur his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. Genesis 38.2-6. And we know that, he was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. But that's it. Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. 38. 7. God killed Ur for doing something, but the Bible doesn't say what it was. So what did Ur do? Did he get drunk and lie around naked in his tent and then curse his unborn grandson and all of his descendants with slavery because his son saw him drunk and naked? No that was Noah, a preacher of righteousness. 9. 
Did he abandon his first son to die in the desert and then show his willingness to murder his second son for God as a human sacrifice? No, that was Abraham, the friend of God. 10. Did he offer his two virgin daughters to a sex-crazed mob of angel rapers and then get drunk and impregnate them? No that was Lot, a just and righteous man. 11. So what was it that pissed off God so much that he just had to kill him? You'd think if it was important enough to kill him, it would be important enough to tell us why. 7. Onan spilled it on the ground, so the Lord killed him too. In his last killing, God killed Ur for being wicked. Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. Genesis 38.7. So Judah told Ur's brother, Onan, to have sex with his dead brother's wife. Judah said unto Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife. 38.8. And Onan, went in unto, her all right, but in the process he, spilled it on the ground. Onan knew that the seed should not be his, and it came to pass, when he went in unto his brother's wife, that he spilled it on the ground. 38.9 Then God, who was watching the whole thing, killed Onan for ejaculating outside the vagina of his dead brother's wife. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, wherefore he slew him. Also, 38.10 this story is used by believers to justify their condemnation of everything. From masturbation, which is sometimes called, onanism, to birth control. But I think it's just another nasty, amoral Bible story. If there is a moral to the story, though, I guess it is this, be careful where you ejaculate. 8. God's seven-year, worldwide famine. This one is all about Joseph. There's a whole series of Joseph stories in Genesis. Jacob loved Joseph more than his other children, Genesis 37.3, Joseph's brothers throw him in a well, 37.24, Joseph is rescued from the well and sold to the Ishmaelites, 37.28, Joseph goes to prison after being falsely accused of rape, 39.20, Joseph interprets the dream of his cellmate, 40.8-19, Joseph interprets the Pharaoh's dream, 41.25-32, the Pharaoh makes Joseph the overseer of all of Egypt 41.33. The Bible isn't too clear on this, but as near as I can tell, God starved everyone on earth so that Joseph could become the most powerful person in Egypt by interpreting the Pharaoh's dream so that God could get the Israelites enslaved by Pharaoh and then rescue them by sending plagues on the Egyptians. Or something like that. Okay, that all makes perfect sense. But what was the Pharaoh's dream? Well, there were these seven fat, good looking cows that came out of the Nile followed by seven skinny, ugly cows. The skinny cows ate the fat ones. And it came to pass, that Pharaoh dreamed, and, behold, he stood by the river. And, behold, there came up out of the river seven well-favored kine, and fat-fleshed, and they fed in a meadow. And, behold, seven other kine, came up after them out of the river, ill-favored and lean-fleshed, and stood by the other kine upon the brink of the river. And the ill-favored and Lean-fleshed kind did eat up the seven well-favored and fat kind. So, Pharaoh awoke. Genesis 41.1-4. Then Pharaoh had another dream. This time seven skinny heads of grain ate. Seven fat ones. And he slept and dreamed the second time. And, behold, seven ears of corn. Came up upon one stalk, rank and good. And, behold, seven thin ears and. Blasted with the east wind sprung up after them. And the seven thin ears. Devoured the seven rank and full ears. And Pharaoh awoke, and, behold, it was a dream. 41.5-7. Nobody could interpret Pharaoh's dream. So, they called Joseph. Joseph said it was simple. God was going to send seven good years followed by seven years of famine. And the famine would be worldwide. And, very grievous. This is the thing which, God is about to do. There come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, and there shall arise after them seven years of famine it shall be very grievous, the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. 41.28-32. Joseph said the Pharaoh should have the Egyptians store up food during the seven good years so they wouldn't starve like everyone else during the bad. And it all happened just like Joseph said it would. The Pharaoh did what Joseph suggested and had Joseph oversee it all. And Joseph became the most powerful person in Egypt. So things worked out well for Joseph, but not so well for everyone else. When the famine struck, everyone on earth, including the Egyptians, had to buy their food from Joseph. If they couldn't make it to Egypt or didn't have enough money, they starved. It was all part of God's plan. 
the seven years of dearth began to come, according as Joseph had said. And the dearth was in all lands, and the famine was over all the face of the earth, and all countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn. Because that the famine was so sore in all lands. 41.54 minus 57 But how many people starved to death during God's seven-year famine? I have no idea, but since the Bible says it was, over all the face of the earth, and was a very grievous famine, I figure it must have been at least 70,000 or so. 10,000 each year. Exodus. The point of Exodus is this, God likes some people more than others. He likes Jews and hates Egyptians. That's why he hardened the Pharaoh's heart and sent the ten plagues on Egypt. He forced Egyptians to drink blood, pestered them with frogs, lice, flies, and boils, smashed them with hail, murdered every firstborn Egyptian child and animal, and drowned their army. Sometimes God gets a bit carried away when making a point. There are some people, though, that God hates even more than Egyptians. Amalekites, for example. God hates Amalekites more than anyone else on earth. He's been at war with them for 3,400 years and he'll be at war with them forever. But God often hates Jews too. When Aaron made a golden calf and encouraged the Jews to dance naked around it, God wanted to kill them all. But, Moses talked him out of it. So God was satisfied with forcing some of the Jews to kill their families, friends, and neighbors. 9. There will be blood, the first plague of Egypt. The first of the famous ten plagues of Egypt was the plague of blood. Here's the story from Exodus 7. God told Moses to tell Aaron to turn all the water in Egypt into blood with his rod. 12. Dot. Stand by the river's brink. Dot and the rod which was turned into a serpent. Shalt thou take in thine hand, and stretch out thine hand upon the waters of Egypt, that they may become blood, and Moses and Aaron did so as the Lord commanded. Exodus 7.15-20 and it worked as planned. The fish died, the river stank, and the Egyptians had no water to drink. And the fish that was in the river died, and the river stank, and the Egyptians could not drink of the water of the river, and there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. 7.21. For seven days, apparently. And seven days were fulfilled, after that the Lord had smitten the river. 7.25. Which must have killed some people, since, even under the most favorable conditions, a person can't survive for more than a few days without water. But how many? The Bible doesn't say, so I guess 10,000. 10. The seventh plague of Egypt. Hail. The first plague of Egypt was the water to blood trick in the last killing. Here are. The next five. 2. Frogs. 8.1-7. 3. Lice. 8.16-19. 4. Flies. 8.21-24. 5. All cattle in Egypt die. 9.3-6. 6. Festering boils on man and beast. 9.9-10. The Bible doesn't say whether anyone died from these five plagues. Frogs, lice, flies, dead animals as far as you can see, these things were no doubt unpleasant. But did it kill anyone? There's just no way of knowing. But the Bible is clear about the seventh plague. Hail. Upon every man and beast which shall be found in the field, the hail shall come down upon them, and they shall die. So there was hail, and fire, mingled with the hail, very grievous. And the hail smote throughout all the land of Egypt all that was in the field, both man and beast. Exodus 9 19-25. So God killed everybody in Egypt who was out and about that day with fire and hail, except Israelites. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, was there no hail. 926. But how many people would that have been? Well, the Egyptian population is estimated to have been 3 million at the time. The exodus supposedly happened. 13. Dot. So if 10% of the Egyptians were in the field. At the time, 300,000 would have been killed by God's fiery hailstorm. 11. The Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. God starts planning this mass murder in chapter 3 of Exodus, and he doesn't. Stop talking about it until he kills every Egyptian firstborn child and animal in. Exodus 12. Here was the way God planned it. On the night of the mass child murder, God told each Israelite family to find a year old lamb without blemish, kill it, and wipe the blood on the top and sides of the door. In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb without blemish, a male of the first year, and ye shall kill it in the evening, and they shall take of the blood, and strike it on the two side posts, and on the upper door post of the houses. Exodus 12.3-7.
that way when God came through Egypt looking for firstborn children and animals to kill, he would see the bloody door and pass over the house, saying to himself, oh yeah, I'm not supposed to kill any children or animals here, for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, 12.12 minus 13 and that's what happened. At midnight God passed through Egypt killing every Egyptian firstborn child, an animal. At midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. 12.29. After God was done, there was not a single Egyptian house that didn't have one dead child, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. 12.30. Why did God do it? Well, it seems that he did it to show off. To show off his signs and wonders. I will, smite Egypt with all my wonders. 3.20. I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. 7.3. Go in unto Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart, and the heart of his servants, that I might show these my signs before him. 10.1. The Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. 11.9. To introduce himself to the Egyptians, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. 7.5. To show what he can do. Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. 6.1. To show that there is nobody else on earth quite like him. For I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart, and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. 9.14. To make himself famous, that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. 9.16. To give us a story to tell our children and grandchildren, that thou mayest tell in the ears of thy son, and of thy son's son, what things I have wrought in Egypt. 10.2. To show that the whole earth belongs to him that thou mayest know how that the earth is the Lord's. 9.29. To prove that he is God. In this thou shalt know that I am the Lord. 7.17. That ye may know how that I am the Lord. 10.2. To show that he likes Israelites more than Egyptians. That ye may know how that the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. 11.7. And to punish the Egyptian gods. Against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. 12.12. Well, I guess those motives are about as good as any for a mass murder. In any case, God is clearly proud of this one. And it's no wonder. It wasn't all that easy to pull off, even for God. He had to harden the Pharaoh's heart eight times to make it all work out as planned. 1. I will harden his heart, that he shall not let the people go. Exodus 4.21. 2. I will harden Pharaoh's heart. 7.3. 3. He hardened Pharaoh's heart, that he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said, 7.13, 4, the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, 9.12, 5, the Lord said unto Moses, go in unto Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart, and the heart of his servants, that I might show these my signs before him, 10.1, 6, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, so that he would not let the children of Israel go, 10.20, 7, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go, 10.27, 8, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, so that he would not let the children of Israel go out of his land. 11.10. Some hearts are hard for even the Bible God to harden. So how many were killed in this killing? Well, the population of Egypt at the time the exodus supposedly occurred was about 3 million. 14. Dot. If one-sixth of them were firstborn sons, a half million Egyptians were killed by God, or the angel sent by God to do his dirty work for him. 12. The Lord took off their chariot wheels. God's last mass murder pretty much did the trick. The night that God killed every firstborn Egyptian child and animal, Pharaoh told Moses to go. He called for Moses and Aaron by night, and said, Rise up, and get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go. Serve the Lord, as ye have said. Also take your flocks and your herds, as ye have said, and be gone, and bless me also. Exodus 12 31-32. So Moses rounded up all three million or so Israelites. 15. Their flocks, herds, cattle, unleavened bread, and all the silver, gold, and clothes that they could steal from the Egyptians, and left town. The people took their dough before it was leavened, and they borrowed of 
the Egyptians jewels of silver, and jewels of gold, and raiment, and they spoiled the Egyptians, about six hundred thousand on foot that were men, beside children, and flocks, and herds, even very much cattle. 12.34 minus 38. And everything would have ended happily ever after, too, if God could have resisted the temptation to harden the Pharaoh's heart a few more times. You see, the Pharaoh's heart was just too damn soft to suit God. So he set about hardening it a bit more. I will harden Pharaoh's heart, that he shall follow after them, and I will be honored upon Pharaoh, and upon all his host, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. 14.4. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh. 14.8. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them, and I will get me honor upon Pharaoh, and upon all his host, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. When I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. 14.17 minus 18. So God hardened Pharaoh's heart some more and got himself a little more honor. Of course he had to kill some more Egyptians so that they would know that he is the Lord. Sometimes you have to kill people in order to get to know them better. So that's what God did. And you saw the movie. 16 so you know the rest of the story. God parted the sea so the Israelites could cross and then drowned the Egyptian army. The Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea, and the waters returned, and covered the chariots, and the horsemen, and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them, there remained not so much as one of them. 14.26 minus 28 but the part one like best they didn't show in the movie. God got right out there. With his wrenches and whatnot and removed the wheels from the Egyptian chariots. How cool is that? The Lord, took off their chariot wheels. 14.24 minus 25. That would have been fun to watch. Okay, so how many Egyptians drowned to get God some more honor? Well, we know there were at least 600, since that's how many chariots the Pharaoh sent after the Israelites. And he took 600 chosen chariots, and all the chariots of Egypt, and captains over every one of them. 14.7. But along with the chariots there were, horsemen, and all the host of Pharaoh. That chased after the three million or so escaping slaves. So although I probably greatly underestimated the imaginary number, I guessed 5,000. 13. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to Generation before the Israelites had even left Egypt, they began to do what they do best. Complain. They complain when they see the Pharaoh's chariots. When Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us, to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians, than that we should die in the wilderness. Exodus 14.10-12 They complain when they're starving to death. The whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness, and the children of Israel said unto them, would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. When we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full, for ye have brought us forth into this wilderness, to kill this whole assembly with hunger. 16.2-3. They complain when dying of thirst. There was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses, and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said, Unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? And, the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses, and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt, to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? 17.1-3. Before long, God will respond to their complaints with several mass murders. But we'll leave that for another time. Because now it's time for some holy war. The Amalekites show up and the fight begins. God controls the whole thing. With some remote control magic tricks. Every time Moses raises his hands, the Amalekites are slaughtered by the Israelites. When he gets tired and lets his arms down, the situation is reversed. When Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed, and when he let down 
his hand, Amalek prevailed. 17.11. Eventually they had to sit Moses down on a rock and hold his arms up to ensure that the right people got killed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone, and put it under him. And he sat thereon, and Aaron and her stayed up his hands. 17.12. But it all worked out just fine. Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. 17.13. It's too bad, though, that the Bible doesn't say how many Amalekites died in this magical holy war, because now I'll just have to guess. Oh heck, I'll call it 1000. But God was far from done with the Amalekites. In fact, he is fighting with them still and commands us all to kill them wherever and whenever we see them. The Lord said unto Moses, write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Exodus 17.14. The Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Exodus 17.16. Thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, thou shalt not forget it. Deuteronomy 25, 19. So if you happen to see an Amalekite, you know what to do. 14. Who is on the Lord's side, forcing friends and family to kill each other? In his previous killings, God killed indiscriminately. He drowned everyone and everything in the flood, smashed people with burning stones at Sodom and Gomorrah, and killed every Egyptian firstborn child and animal just for the heck of it. So I guess we should be used to this sort of thing by now. But in this killing, God forces 3,000 friends and family members to kill each other. That seems kind of nasty even for a very nasty God. Here are the gory details. Moses was up on Mount Sinai getting the Ten Commandments from God. Since he'd been gone so long, he'd been up there for 40 days, the people began to wonder if he'd ever come back. So they asked Aaron to make some other gods for them. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people said unto him, Aaron, up, make us gods, Exodus 32.1. Aaron thought that was a pretty good idea, so he told the people to give him their earrings which were in their ears. Aaron said unto them, break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. Dot dot dot. And he, made it a molten calf. 32.2-4. You might think that a bunch of runaway slaves wouldn't have much gold. But God told them to steal whatever jewelry they could find from the Egyptians. The children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver, and jewels of gold, and raiment. And they spoiled the Egyptians. 12.35 minus 36. I guess God wanted them to have enough gold to make a golden calf. It was all part of his plan. So the people gave Aaron their stolen gold and Aaron made a golden calf. Now making a golden calf out of a pile of earrings in a campfire might seem hard to you. But Aaron just threw them all onto a fire and out came a golden calf. Really, I, Aaron, said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So, they gave it me. Then I cast it into the fire, and there came out this calf. 32.24. It was a miracle. God, or Satan, made the golden calf when Aaron threw the jewelry on the fire. But God still wasn't satisfied. When he first found out about the golden calf, and the naked dancing he wanted to kill everyone and start over with a new batch of people, the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and, behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. 32.9-10. But Moses talked him out of it, saying, What would the Egyptians say? Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Should the Egyptians speak? And say, For mischief did he bring them out, to slay them in the mountains, and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from thy fierce wrath, and repent of this evil against thy people. 32.11 minus 1215, made. In his last killing, God forced the Israelites to kill each other. The Levites, volunteered for the job of, being on the Lord's side, by killing their family, friends, and neighbors for God. The resulting death toll was 3,000. But this didn't quite satisfy God. He needed to kill some more. So he sent a, plague. The Lord plagued the people, because they made the calf, which Aaron, made. Exodus 32.35. The Bible doesn't say how many people God killed in this plague. I'll guess. 
1000, Leviticus. Leviticus tells us how to kill animals for God and how to kill people for breaking God's laws. So it only has time for two killings. But they are doozies. In the first killing, God burns Aaron's sons to death for offering, strange fire. And in the second, God commands a blasphemer to be stoned to death. 16. God burns Aaron's sons to death for offering, strange fire. The story begins with Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, burning, strange fire. Before the Lord, some kind of weird incense that God didn't like very much. Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. Leviticus 10.1. So God burned them to death, and there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them, and they died. Before the Lord. 10.2. And here's what Moses said to Aaron afterwards. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. 10.3 A. God burned Aaron's sons alive so that God would be sanctified in them, and so that he would be glorified. That helps. Moses warned Aaron not to mourn the death of his sons by uncovering his head or tearing his clothes or God would kill him too, along with all the people. Moses said unto Aaron, Uncover not your heads, neither rend your clothes, lest ye die, and lest wrath come upon all the people. 10.6. So Aaron did as he was told, and watched in silence as his sons were burned to death by God. And Aaron held his peace. 10.